of the things that inspired this movie was the destruction of a work of art. Something removed from the world, like a light going out in the universe. Theo is attached to objects. The object that haunts him most is this painting that he stole. I think he finds sort of peacefulness in objects and antiques. The idea that they're bigger than you, they have been around a lot longer than you, and that they will be around longer than you is an idea that comforts him. It's hundreds of years of being touched. It's life. And I think something about Theo thinking he had that painting and knowing he had that painting was connecting him to something that he could no longer have. And I think for every piece of jewelry you have that belonged to your grandmother or a favorite aunt, or, you know, a loved one's anything that has their scent, it's a very powerful, potent thing. Do you have a responsibility back to something if you love it? And that painting of that little bird is looking at you and you're looking at it. And it's not enough for it to just simply have a price tag on it or to simply pass it by in a museum. It's sort of demanding of you that it be looked after and that in a sense, what you experience from it, you then have a responsibility to pass on. And I think that's quite an important idea. Do you know that it was his last painting because he died in an explosion and somehow miracle after miracle, it survives through centuries until you. Carl Fabrizius would have been one of the most talented painters of his time had he not died so young. He came from a small town, Beemster, and he went to study with Rembrandt in Amsterdam and then moved to the city of Delft. What happens then is quite tragic. In 1654, there's a giant explosion in a warehouse, city of Delft, and really a good part of the city goes up in flames. And sadly, Fabrizius' studio was in that area and he died in that explosion. The result is that we only have a small number of works by him. We have roughly 12 paintings left by his hand, each one very innovative and interesting. They mustn't see it. The goldfinch is in that group really in a unique position. A lot of mystery around this little painting. It's a tiny painting, but it really packs a punch and still has a lot of unanswered questions. It's painted on a really, really thick piece of wood. We don't know why, very unusual. You see very prominently Fabrizio's own signature and tragically the year of his death, 1654. So it was one of the last things he made. We put it through a CT scanner, if you can believe it. And we found all kinds of things. We found, for example, that there were little holes all around the panels with a few old nails left in it. So that begged the question, what was he doing? Was it built into a cabinet? Was it part of a door? Some people even speculate that it might have been the cover of a birdcage. So we really don't know why he used that material and what he was up to. The thing about the goldfinch is, when you see it in a gallery with other paintings of the time, they're all kind of of a school, like there's these landscapes, there's these social country life tableaus. They were trying to be almost photographic, and there's almost no brush strokes. It's almost like glass. And then you see the goldfinch. But the goldfinch is very gestural, and yet it feels alive. It's a bit of a parlor trick. They tried to make it so real looking as if it's a real bird chained to the little bar that it sits on and you look up as if there's a real bird there. Very quickly, you begin to project emotions onto that painting, and you begin to think it's almost breathing, and it's about to fly off that perch, and yet you can see the brush strokes. We call a painting like this a trompe l'oeil, is a French word for fool the eye, which makes you think, when you look at it, oh, that must be a real bird sitting up there on his cage. Fabrizio was saying, look, I can make something so lifelike that you're convinced there's an actual little bird there against a white wall about to flutter away. The goldfinch is in a very, very beautiful museum in The Hague called the Maurice House. It's quite a small museum, but has an astonishing collection of Dutch Golden Age paintings. Well, the Maurice House really, truly is a unique museum. We're really small. All we do is Dutch paintings of the 17th century and around that time. The second thing that makes this place really special is the setting. It's housed in a 17th century, really, a mansion. That means that visitors who come here can really get right up close to the wonderful paintings we have in the collection. 
Every room has a kind of familiar icon like Rembrandt. And probably the most famous at this point is Vermeer's Girl with the Pearl Earring. I think what people experience when they come here is instant recognition with some of our icons in the collection. We gave the Goldfinch a very special place. It now has lots of room to breathe. It has become quite a destination. People come to the Mars House to see the Goldfinch. And I think coming to see the picture here in the Mars House is a special experience because you can get right up close to it. And I promise you, we're gonna keep it safe. And the whole process of how to reproduce paintings in a way that actually photographs properly the Merch House, we're incredibly helpful with. I think one of the things that makes the Goldfinch really remarkable is that it reproduces really well. I've seen it blown up, you know, 20 times and it still looks great. We created a number of versions of the painting and it had to be of sufficiently authentic quality that it could be photographed in extreme detail, which it is. It's always a myth that people think, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to, like, you going to have it printed on canvas or are you going to recreate it? Well, we wanted to be extremely true to it. At the museum, they have a 3D scanner that has actually scanned the surface and then rebuilt the painting in layers to scale. And I was doubtful. I thought, oh, this is going to be a bad reproduction. And then we held it up next to the painting. Here's this and here's this. I was really impressed with how close they were. Very, very impressive. And so we decided that we would use that as our, our painting. We blew it up digitally and then overpainted exactly the same painting strokes that we could see revealed in the print. Well, we're doing uh, that larger version of a goldfinch, what do you see? It's for close-up, for insert shot. It imitates exactly the original copy, so every brush stroke is supposed to look the same. We're using the hot wax as a special technique to prep the surface close to the old oil paintings, but in a fast version of the 21st century. So if before it was spent a weeks to do it, they have to do it like a day and a half, two days. It's that little bird chained to its stoop, staring back at you. And for such a small, tiny object, it's incredibly powerful. Having freedom to fly, but being chained down is very relative to us as human beings, I think, on this big planet that we roll around on. What it's standing on is out there and in the light. A lot of the paintings from that time weren't like that. The painting, in a symbolic way throughout the story, is Theo trying to find his own freedom, I think, and trying to find an answer to let go of his angst and his damage. So he just needs to unchain himself from his baggage. What about it? He's safely back in the world. <laughs> an appreciation of beauty and the way in which beautiful objects can weave their way into your life and can become things that actually bind people together, not in a very sort of light way, in a very, in a very direct way across time, is something that speaks to an essential humanity and I think is a profoundly important message.